Genesis chapter 32. There are aspects about revival that are true in every single revival. There are some parts about revivals as we study about different revivals in the past and and uh, there's some kind of uh, things that are just specific to that revival, but there are some other principles that are true about every single revival. And this morning I want to preach a message entitled, Brokenness, the Beginning of Revival. Every revival that has ever taken place has begun with brokenness. And that is what we're going to be looking at this morning. So Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no, no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he, and he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. We have here the story of Jacob wrestling with God and being broken by God. And brokenness is the beginning of revival. Uh, we'll see, uh, number one, Jacob got alone with God. Number two, Jacob was hungry for God. Number three, Jacob was broken by God. And then number four, Jacob got honest with God. As we enter into this chapter, what do we know about Jacob? Uh, we remind ourselves that he had a brother named Esau. Uh, and Jacob and Esau were all at odds with each other. They got along like brothers do. And, uh, and Jacob stole the birthright and the blessing of Esau. I was asking my wife one day, I said, what do you, you know, what can you tell me about Jacob and Esau? And she said, well, Esau is the first person to ever experience identity theft. And, uh, and that's true. Uh, that's a prevalent crime these days. Well, this is where it first took place. Uh, the identity theft. His parents are Isaac and Rebecca, grandfather Abraham, and eventually here Jacob has the 12 sons of which, uh, we're learning a little bit more about Joseph. Uh, some tremendous lessons in the life of Joseph. Now here in Genesis chapter 32, we find Jacob in a very critical point in his life. Uh, this is uh, a time where he uh, hears that his brother is coming to meet him. Now the last time that Jacob had heard about his brother is found in Genesis 27 and verses 41 and 42 when he says, uh, uh, he says, the days, Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. And Rachel told Jacob, you need to get out of here because Esau wants to kill you. And so that's the last thing he knows of Esau. So this is a very critical time in Jacob's life. Uh, this could be the very last day that he's going to live. Now Jacob is no dummy. He's smart. He, he's been scheming his whole life. And so he schemes and puts his group of family and all of his flocks and, and his servants into two different sections. So if Esau met this one section of his family, then and he would slay that family, the other one would, would live on and he would have a remnant. And so he was no dummy in that, and so he uh, tried to exhaust all of his methods, all of the things that he was trying to do was exhausted until he got alone with God. Now Jacob, number one, got alone with God. Look at verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there breasted the man with him, until the breaking of the day. Now Jacob did not seek after this man. Jacob did not seek after God, but God was seeking after Jacob. And maybe Jacob at first thought it was Esau. Maybe he had that thinking like, oh no, this is Esau and I've got to wrestle for my life. And it is going to be a wrestle. 
uh, of his life and for his life. But he got alone with God. You see, he got away from his family, he got away from all the distractions, and he got alone with God. When's the last time you've been alone with God? When's the last time you eliminated all of the distractions and got alone with God? So often we let busyness or laziness and other wrong priorities come into our lives to where we don't get alone and spend that time that we need with the Lord. Mark 4.19, "...and the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches..." And the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It's easy for the word of God to be choked as we hear the preaching of God's word every week, and and we can go home and and watch the football games and watch the different things. And the word of God that was sown in our life can be choked by the cares of the world. And we need to get alone with God. Uh, we need to seek Him out. The Bible tells us in Psalm forty six ten, "Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth." Psalm 10, 4 says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Is, has God been in your thoughts this past week? Have you been thinking about God? Uh, here the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Now I went off to Ambassador Baptist College, and it's a small Bible college, and the standards there are very high. Uh, you have to wear a tie, uh, at least a tie, but they want to have a suit. Every day at class, I had a tie or a suit coat on. Um, and so there's high standards. All the, the girls have to wear skirts and, and uh, no pants there in the classrooms and so on. And we had high standards when it came to dating. And so there were certain limits that we had as far as our time each day that we had together, how many dates we would have during the week. And so when Megan and I first got together, it was a Saturday. It was a Valentine's banquet. It's coming up pretty soon, our, our anniversary when we first got together. And I, it was a Saturday. We got together. We were with some other friends. The next day was Sunday night. Uh, Sunday night is the next time we got together, and we were kind of by ourselves. We were at the uh, cafeteria. We're going to be eating the evening meal. And it was the first time where we didn't have any other friends around us. It was just her and I. And I was looking forward to this time. Because other than that, we've been around people. Now it's a time that I can just talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. And so we get our food, and, and uh, we sit down, and I pray. And after I'm done praying, one of my friends comes up uh, up over to us, and he starts talking to us. Now, I've been in the school. I'm a senior this year uh, when, when Megan and I got together. And I've you know had friends that got started dating, and all of a sudden, I was just you know chopped liver. Uh, I didn't matter anything at all, and you know they all only wanted to spend time with each other. And so I'm thinking, you know what? As a as a resident advisor, as a person in leadership uh, position in charge of a dorm, I said I've got to have and it set an example with my dating relationship. And so I thought I'm going to be friendly to this guy. And so we start talking. I asked him, I don't know, maybe one, maybe two questions. Now this guy that that started talking, he likes to talk, and talk is what he did. Uh, he kept talking, we start eating our food, we eventually finish, and he's still talking. Now maybe he's thinking, oh, this poor girl, uh, she probably got stuck with Tim, because I've never seen Tim with a girl before any time in the four years that he's been there, so maybe she just got stuck, I'm going to rescue him, and rescue her, or whatever. And, and maybe she, maybe he thought that, because he didn't know that we were together. And, and, and as uh, he kept talking, he finally looks up at the clock, and he says, oh, he says, it's our time to leave, we got to get out of here. And he had taken up the entire time that I was going to spend one-on-one -on -one with Megan. Now, how do you think that made me feel? Do you think that I was glad about that? No! A thousand times no! I was so mad and so upset at that, I now realize why some of my friends would push me off. And I, and I was like, this guy, I'm not going to ask him another question again. I can talk to you anytime I want, but I only have a certain amount of time that I can talk to her. And all that made me so upset and so angry that I could not get that time with my future wife. Question, are you upset? Are you angry when you don't get that time with the Lord? When things come in, maybe you wake up late and, and you don't have that quiet time with the Lord and you got to go off to work and you got to face the world. Does it bother you when you don't have that quiet time with the Lord? Does it bother you when that one-on-one -on -one time is interrupted. Oh, I was so jealous and protective of that time with her. And we need to be jealous and protective of our time with God. So number one, Jacob got alone with God. But then number two, Jacob 
was hungry for God. Verse 25, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. First, uh, as this wrestling match starts, God has a hold of Jacob. Uh, God has a hold of him. Does God have a hold of your life? Sir, ma'am, young person, does God have a hold of your life? A couple of years ago, I was asking uh, uh, Brother Mike Kelly, I said, why do you do what you do? Uh, what motivates you to serve God? And he says, you know, Tim, I just consider it my reasonable service. And I immediately thought, I wish other Christians had that same attitude. That I'm going to serve God, it's just my reasonable service. Romans 12.1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God does not ask us to do anything unreasonable. And this isn't the height of Christianity. Oh, if someday I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice. No, this isn't the pinnacle of Christianity. It's the very bottom. It's the very basic. It's the first things. That we're going to give our all because He's given our all, His all for us. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And that He died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. So first, God gets a hold of Jacob. And now Jacob wants to, to cling on and get a hold of God. And he's saying, I'm not going to let you go. So before Jacob ever got a hold of God, God had a hold of Jacob. And there's a principle with that. Before you and I can ever get a hold of the ear of God, He must have a hold of us. Before you and I can ever get a hold of the ear of God, He must have a hold of us. Oh, you may pray and pray, but if you're not surrendered, if there's sin in your heart, God says stop praying. Don't pray to me. Uh, stop praying until you get those things right. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Proverbs 29, 28, verse 9. He that turneth his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. How's your attitude towards God's Word this morning? Do you have a desire to hear it or are you wanting to turn your ear away from it? If you're wanting to turn your ear away from the Word of God, your prayers are abomination to God. He says there in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9. So Jacob is now the one that desires to get a hold of who is wrestling with him. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. He's desperate. He needs God to do something. Something's got to change. Because the next day, his life could be over. He is in a desperate situation and he needs God. When's the last time you were desperate for God? When's the last time you say, God, if you don't come through, everything's going to fail. Everything's going to fall. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make it if you don't come through. God was, he was desperate for God. He was hungry for that blessing. He needed something from God. And God has all that we need. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to pay the price for revival? We go through that, that uh, pamphlet on that uh, sweet hour of prayer. And there was a time in my life where I looked at that sweet hour of prayer pamphlet and for days I would read that, are you, uh, are you really concerned about revival? And I would say, well, Lord, I am, you know, I am concerned about revival, but, and then I'd get to that second question, are you willing to pay the price for personal revival? And I'd say, no, God, I'm not. And I'd put it away. Next day in my devotions again, I would bring it back out and I would be faced with that question again, are you willing to pay the price? And I said, no, God, I'm not. And for several days, I would say, no, no, no. And then finally, I said, okay, God, whatever it takes, whatever it, the price that I've got to pay to be revived, I'm willing to go through. And it was that day that God broke me. And God changed my life. And gave me a, an experience like Jacob in a way. And so, God desires uh, to get a hold of us. And we ought to desire to get a hold of God. Uh, so often, though, we place all of the kinds of things before the Lord. We place sports. Uh, we place our jobs and, and uh, friends and so on. And God wants us to seek Him first. And we need to have a thirst and a hunger for God. Uh, to be desperate for the Lord. So Isaiah 44.3 says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. If you hunger and thirst after God, He's going to meet those needs. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So before Jacob ever got a hold of God, God had to have 
a hold of Jacob. So number one, Jacob got alone with God. Number two, Jacob was hungry for God. And now number three, Jacob was broken by God. We see here that he touches the hollow of Jacob's thigh or his hip joint. Uh, he puts it there uh, out of joint. And, and here Jacob, with, uh, with all of his strength, there's so much strength in the legs of a man, and, and yet God takes him and just touches the very place where he is the strongest and makes him weak to where he can't wrestle anymore. All he can do is just hold on. Uh, he can't wrestle any longer. And that's why he says, uh, I will not let you go except you bless me. And so Jacob became broken by God. Uh, the word brokenness occurs 186 times in the Bible. And it's used in a variety of ways. We remind ourselves of the uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and how that the uh, little boy had his sack lunch there and and uh, those uh, uh, that and Jesus went and broke that bread and and broke the fish and was able to feed those five thousand. Well, before they could ever uh, be used, they had to be broken. And we find that uh, with uh, with even uh, uh, when Mary was sitting was uh, worshiping at Jesus' feet and breaks open the uh, that expensive ointment, that perfume, she had to break it open before it could be used. And before we can be used of God, we also need to be broken before Him. I think of our communion service. We remind ourselves, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so brokenness is throughout the Bible. And there's two types of brokenness that I'm talking about this morning. Number one is like a special time like Jacob. Uh, there's a special time in, this, in Jacob's life. This isn't going to happen again in Jacob's life. This is a special time. And I've had those where, where I've got memories where, yep, that was a, a specific time that God broke me. There were other men in the Bible that were broken. Job said that God had broken him asunder. Jeremiah said that his heart within him was broken. Uh, David came to the, to the point of brokenness uh, after being confronted by his sin by the prophet Nathan. He says in Psalm 51.8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, which the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. And what is he talking about? Was it his physical bones that were broken? No. It was that intense inward pain that he was experiencing. That conviction, uh, that, that intense inward pain, that's what he was talking about. He was broken before God. God loves us so much and desires to repair that brokenness in our lives. As I was teased yesterday at the uh, breakfast and, and visitation time that I am a man that uh, I guess that is consistent. Uh, whether I am somewhat... Uh, casual or uh, dressed up a little bit, I always have something of the Royals on. And a uh, big Kansas City Royals fan, those of you who uh, don't know baseball immediately feel sorry for me when I say Kansas City Royals. Those of you that say, I don't even know what they are, you know, are they a football team, are they a minor league team? Sometimes they play like a minor league team, but, uh, you know, they're, they're just pathetic. And I've been a Royals fan all my life. And when I was tw uh, 10 years old, Mrs. Gilbert came to our Christian school and she wanted us to make a plate. And so uh, we drew on these pieces of paper and I think she baked in the, uh, the, uh, the paper into this plate. And so when I was 10 years old, I drew this. Uh, you got Kansas City Royals, George Brett, and his statistics uh, from 1980 when he won the, the MVP. And, and so I remember when I first got this plate, I thought, wow, you know, even though uh, it doesn't look all that nice. This isn't something that you probably would want to buy at Walmart or anything. But it was special to me because I'm thinking, wow, I drew that. And so whenever we would have, you know, maybe uh, we had a special pizza night at home, I would make sure that I ate off of this plate. This was my favorite plate. This plate went through me all the way into college. And when Megan and I got married, I was still using this plate. I mean, this is my favorite plate. Uh, I love this plate more than any other plate with all of the different doilies and so on that are on our other plates. I, you know, this one's my favorite. And I've used this plate more than any other plate in my life. And this plate is so special to me. Why? Because I made it. Uh, because I'm the one that drew all of these things. Nobody has a plate like this one. You say nobody would want a plate like this one. But nobody has a plate like this one. It's unique. And you know, God loves you so much and has made you different than anybody else. Uh, he made you with, uh, with different fingerprints. Uh, if you were able to take your ear and, and, uh, and, and dip it in ink, you have a different ear print. Same thing with the tongue. Uh, God has made us unique. Nobody is the same. And God loves us. Uh, God loves you. 
And so I remember I would use this plate uh, sometimes in illustrations. And a couple of years ago, we were in Illinois, and uh, we flew, we were flying back from, from preaching a meeting there in Illinois, and we opened up the luggage, and all of a sudden I saw my plate, and it was broken in two. You can't see it, those in the back, but those in the front can see a crack all the way up right here. And when I saw that, my heart just sunk. Just thought, oh man, that's my favorite plate. Uh, and, and I was just, and I thought, man, we didn't pack it well enough. And I was, I was just so upset that it was broken. And so I threw it away. No, I didn't do that, did I? You see that I have, still have it. What I do, I glued it. I put it back together. And I'll tell you, as, as I've traveled and this thing uh, has gone through many miles, it's been to Alaska and so on. Uh, this plate has gone through a lot and it's broken a couple of times. And uh, so now I keep taping stuff. I've got it glued and taped all back there. And I didn't throw it away just because it was broken. No, I wanted to repair it. I wanted to put it back together. And if I ever lost this plate, I would want to get it back. If somebody found the plate somewhere and they thought, well, there's got to be some crazy Royals fan out there that would pay $20 for this. I'll put this on eBay. And if I was searching and I found this on eBay, you know what I'd do? I'd pay the $20. Now, don't you go and steal my plate after the service and put it on eBay. But I would pay the $20 to get this plate back. I would buy it back because this is my favorite plate. There's no other plate like this. I can't go to Walmart and get this plate. And God made you specifically. God loves you more than you even know. And there are times where you're gonna, you need to be broken before Him. You need to be broken, but God wants to put that brokenness together. And Jesus Christ is able to do that. You see, Jesus Christ, God sent His Son to this earth to buy us back, to redeem us. Uh, it says in, in uh, 2, uh, Titus 2.14, says, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us, to buy us back from all iniquity and purity unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We see when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and, and uh, they rebelled against God and separated themselves from God. Uh, God had a, had a plan. Uh, in Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so God is saying, Satan, you're going to be defeated. Sin's going to be defeated. All you're going to do is just bruise my heel. But he went on to the cross, didn't he? Oh, I was reminded yesterday I was talking to a pastor friend and we were talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. And I now have pictures of what the Garden of Gethsemane looks like. And I don't believe there was anybody in our group uh, that there last year that was at the Garden of Gethsemane that did not shed a tear. Uh, it is just a moving thing as you think about the sacrifice that Christ paid for us. The physical torture that He went through. The crown of thorns that were, I wouldn't assume would be lightly placed upon him. No, I believe they would be slammed down upon his head and the blood would begin to flow. Uh, or the cat of nine tails that those broken pieces of pottery and rock that would just rip the flesh. Uh, as he's nailed there upon the cross and, and, uh, and has those nails upon him and, and, uh, those nails, uh, uh, there on the cross and it wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross, but it was his love. He went through all of the agonies of the cross and all of the mocking and the shame. Why did He do that? For your sin and for mine. He wanted to pay the price for sin. He wanted to conquer sin and conquer death. And He was buried. And on the third day, He rose again and He did just that. He conquered sin and He conquered the grave. You see, you don't have to stay in your sin. You can have victory over sin. Uh, you can be broken, but God can put you back together. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. He rose again and because He lives, we also can have eternal life through Him. The Bible says there's one thing that will never be broken. It's found in John 10, 35. It says the Scriptures cannot be broken. Oh, you can trust this book out of any other book in the entire world. This book stands out above all others. The Scriptures cannot be broken. And I know that if I died today that I would go to heaven because of what the Bible says. It says in Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when I was five years old, I asked you, I confessed my sins to the Lord. I asked Him to come into my life and to save me. And He promised that He would. And so I know that if I died today that I would go to heaven because of this book, because of the Word of God and what it says. Praise God for the salvation that we have and Jesus Christ.
But we as Christians, we also need to be broken. What causes us to have that need to be broken? Pride. Pride. It is said that you can classify all the sins together into one, and that would be pride. You could also do the same with unbelief. Whatever sin you're struggling with, uh, that, that you're committing, uh, you're not thinking correctly about God or about that sin. Uh, you have an unbelief. The Bible says in Proverbs 6.15, says, Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Are you prideful this morning? Or are you broken? I'm going to give you a quiz here. There's seven things. Seven things that describe between a proud person and a broken person. Proud people have a critical, fault-finding spirit. They look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but they view their own with a telescope. Broken people are compassionate. They have a kind love that overlooks a multitude of sins. They can forgive much because they know how much they've been forgiven. Proud people are especially prone to criticize those in positions of authority. Their boss, their parents, their pastor. And they're, then they talk to others about the faults they see. But broken people reverences, encourages, and helps uh, support those in positions of authority. And they talk to God in intercession rather than gossip to others about the faults they see. Proud people are self-protective of their time, their right, their reputation. Broken people are self-denying and self-sacrificing. Proud people try to control the people and the circumstances around them. They're prone to manipulate. Broken people trust in God. They rest in Him and are able to wait for Him to act on their behalf. Proud people compare themselves with others and feel worthy of respect. Broken people compare themselves with God and see a, a, and see a desperate need for His mercy. Proud people don't think they need to repent of anything. Broken people realize they need to maintain a continual heart attitude of repentance. Proud people don't think they need revival. As a matter of fact, they're, they're, they're sure that everybody else is, and they're making a mental note of all the people that should hear this list. But broken people continually sense their need for a fresh filling and encounter of the Holy Spirit of God. What pride do you need to be repentant of? Uh, where have you been prideful in your life? Where do you need to get honest with God about your sin? Though brokenness is painful, it is well worth it. God is the God who heals our brokenness. In a book called The Calvary Road, Roy Hessian states, brokenness is the prerequisite of revival. To be broken is the beginning of revival. There's never been a revival without brokenness. There have been times in my life, just like Jacob, where I had that specific time where God broke me, but there's been other times in my life where I'm thinking about in college and even in high school and so on, where God just took me and broke me to where I see my own nothingness and my own inadequacy before Him. I see the holiness of God. I get a glimpse of that and the glory of God. And, and I see my own sinfulness and, and I weep and I cry out to God for His mercy. And, and, it's, and it hurts to go through that breaking process and that inward pain sometimes is so intense you're not sure that you're going to survive. But God is right there and, and, he, and if we humble ourselves before Him, He will give us that mercy and help us to get through those things and clean us up and mend us up and heal that brokenness. Now Jacob had to allow God to break him before he could change him. And this is a one-in-time account in Scripture. But brokenness isn't just a one-time thing. So we have two different types of brokenness. One, which is, a, which is a special experience like Jacob. And then number two is an everyday response. There's a brokenness that we every day ought to have. Brokenness and daily experience. What does this look like? It's simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. God convicts you, convicts you about something, you respond in humility to Him. When God shows you something, you say, okay, yes, Lord, I submit. Uh, I'm here, I am yours. Being broken is both God's work and ours, Roy Hessian goes on to write in his book. He brings His pressure to bear, but we have to make the choice. And all day long, that choice will be before us in a thousand ways. I enjoy going to spring training to the Royals... Uh, uh, spring training uh, camp there in Surprise, Arizona. One of the things that I love about it is that I realize I'm not the only Royals fan out there. 
Uh, there's actually other people that root for the Royals. Now, they're few in number, but there are some other ones. And so I enjoy being not the only one wearing a Royals hat, uh, wearing a Royals shirt, or things like that. And I enjoy talking to those other people because they know the Royals players and so on, and I enjoy being around them. I enjoy being in churches and, and fellowshipping with other Christians, and that's even the, the best fellowship that we can have is just the sweetness. I was at a church yesterday uh, putting on a choral clinic, and uh, we were talking about the sweetness of the fellowship that we can enjoy, and, and I enjoy being around other Christians. But what kind of people does God like to be around? What kind of people does He draw near to? Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, Thou wilt not despise. So here, God desires to be around people who are broken. You've got pride in your life. God doesn't want to be around you. He hates that pride. It's a stench to His nostrils. But if you're broken before Him, that's the kind of people that, that God wants to draw near to. That means that all pride, selfishness, sin, all of that's got to be emptied and drained out of us. Uh, and when we have that, that attitude, Lord, I submit myself wholly, completely, all that I have, all that I am to You, uh, He will draw near to us. So we see Jacob got broken by God. But then lastly, number four, Jacob got honest with God. He says there in verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And tw verse 27, he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Just Jacob from his very birth was, uh, was a, was a heel catcher. He was a supplanter. He was a deceiver. He was always trying to get uh, uh, get his own good, try to get an advantage of other people. He tricked Esau into selling his birthright. Uh, he stole that blessing uh, from Esau as well. He deceived his father Isaac in giving him the blessing. And all throughout Jacob's life, it just seems like he connives and, and tries to work things out and manipulate things for his own advantage. Genesis 27.12 his mother is telling him, hey, you need to get uh, prepare a meal for, uh, for your father so that you can take and steal this blessing from Esau. And Jacob responds, my father peradventure will feel me, and I shall see to him as a deceiver. Well, that's what you are, Jacob. You are deceiving. Oh, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna, I'm worried about what my father thinks of me that I might actually be a deceiver. He might think I'm a deceiver. Well, that's what you are. You are a deceiver. You are a conniver. Uh, you are out for your own personal gain. You see, Jacob thought uh, and appeared to himself as someone that was spiritual. And oh, how often we can think of ourselves, you know what, I'm spiritual. Uh, because I'm a preacher, I'm spiritual. Because I'm an evangelist, I'm spiritual. Because I teach a Sunday school class, I'm spiritual. Because I have a, a doctorate or, or a reverend or whatever, I'm spiritual. Because I've been a Christian all these lives, I'm spiritual. And it's spiritual pride. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that I'm right with God. Your position doesn't mean that you're right with God. Uh, you're just like with Isaiah. Uh, he says that he saw uh, 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 Uzziah, uh, the year the king Uzziah died. Uzziah went into the holy of holies, uh, went to the tabernacle, and the priest said to him, listen, you're not allowed to be here, but I'm the king. He says, you're not allowed. And, and when he rebelled against God, when he was confronted with his sin and rebelled against God, it was then that God smote him with leprosy. And he died of that leprosy. You see, your position doesn't mean that you're holy. And just because you're a Christian, just because you're in church doesn't mean that you're holy. And Jacob had a spiritual pride about him. And so he goes through these tests and, and goes to his father. And his father asks him, what is your name? Because uh, he sounds like Jacob, but he says, my name is Esau. And he's like, no, that, that voice sounds like Jacob. And so he wants to give him another test, and he says, why don't you come on over here? And, and of course, Jacob, again, he's no dummy. He's got it all played out. Esau's a hairy man, so he's got the, the animal skin upon him. And, and, he, and Jacob uh, goes over to his father, and his father begins to feel to see if it's Esau. Sure enough, it, it's very hairy, and it's and see, yeah, that that must be Esau. But his voice is Jacob, and he comes a little closer, and and he wants to smell his garment to see if his garments of the field, and and he smells his garment. He says, yeah, that garments of the field. You see, Jacob had all of those things taken care of. 
He was able to fool his father. He was able to deceive him. What is thy name? Uh, and Jacob says, my name is Esau. Listen to Proverbs 6.16 in the midst of Jacob here. It says, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and run into mischief, and a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God says, I hate these things. Uh, these things are an abomination to me. You see, he was able to fool Isaac. He was able to fool and trick Laban and, and, and able to get an advantage in Esau. But when he came face to face with God, he was not able to fool God. And when he, when, Je when God asked him, what is thy name? I wonder when he's being asked that question, if all of those scenes of his life, when he's trying to deceive and, and so on and, and get an advantage in Esau's life, when he tries to trick Laban and so on and then deceives his father, uh, I wonder if all of those, those scenes come through his life and, and here Jacob, his very name means supplanter, heel catcher. Uh, and so Jacob says, you know what, God, I am Jacob. I am the deceiver. I am the one that's out for my own personal gain. I'm going to get honest with you, God. No more pretending. No more appearing to myself as someone that's spiritual. No, God, you know me. You know everything about me. And I'm going to get honest with you. Dad, do you need to get honest with God? Mom, do you need to get honest with God? Uh, are, are you appearing more spiritual than what you really are? Teenager, is there some things that are, that, that you're hiding from your parents that your parents don't even know about? I wonder when God asked Jacob what his name was, if his mind raced back to all of those things. You see, the angel had pinned him down and asked him, what is your name? And he had to get honest with God. He says in verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. You see, at Peniel, it doesn't matter what other people think. At Peniel, your reputation does not matter. It doesn't matter what your pastor thinks. It doesn't matter what your family thinks, what your boss thinks. It doesn't matter. When you get face to face with God, nothing else matters. It's just you and God, and God knows you. And you've got to get honest with Him. You see, you can fake it at church. I've done it. You can fake it at a revival meeting. You can fake it at your home. You can fake it at your work. But when you meet face to face with God at Peniel, you cannot fake it. You are completely open and transparent before God. And Jacob says, I'm done fighting you, God. I'm done fighting against you. I'm done pretending uh, to be what I'm not. I, I'm going to get honest with you. My name is Jacob. What if God were to ask you your name? What would you have to say? Gossiper? Luster? Music that God can't stand, listener? Non-tither? What would you, what, if God were to ask you your name, what would you have to say? Maybe you're like, uh, like, uh, Naomi that says, you know what, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Bitter. Because God Almighty had felt very bitterly against me. She says, my name is bitter because that's what I am. What is your name? If God were to ask you your name, what would you say? When you get to Peniel, with the websites you look at, uh, would you look at them at Peniel? The music that is in your car, or the stations, the preset stations in your car, would you listen to those things at Peniel? When you get face to face with God, you've got to be honest with God. He sees you for who you truly are. You see, God touched that hollow of Jacob's thigh, and He broke Jacob's will. That's all God has to do is to touch your thigh and everything you've been fighting against God, uh, everything that you've been trying to work on and, and, uh, and go against God, and all God has to do is just touch your thigh and you're broken before Him. He had to stop pretending in order to let God work in His life. It's an amazing verse, this verse 30. And, God called, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. As I've read different commentaries about this and, and heard messages on this, uh, this very passage, uh, you can think of my life being preserved because the next day he's going to meet Esau. 
And in that encounter, it isn't going to be as terrifying as he thought it was going to be there in chapter 32. So maybe he's referring to the fact that God's going to, God, he's got assurance from God that Esau's not going to kill him. But what I think of when I read that for my life is preserved is that I've wrestled with God. I've fought against God. I've seen God face to face and he let me live. He let me live. You see, others weren't as fortunate. Nadab and Abihu touching the ark, God smote them. Here he sees God face to face. He let me live. My life is preserved. And oh, God did something tremendous. God changed his name. Uh, at verse 28, and God's, and he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Psalm 30, verse 5, For His anger endureth but for a moment, and His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I've never regretted getting honest with God, getting honest with others. Oh, it's been it's hurt several times in my life as I've had to apologize and ask forgiveness from other people. I've never regretted any time in my life that I've done what's right. Never have. But I've always regretted when I've rebelled against God. When God's convicted my heart and I said, no God. Oh, when you come broken before God, He heals that brokenness. He puts you back and He can make you and, and mold you and use you once again. God had to break him before He could change him. For the rest of his life, Jacob's going to have a limp. Maybe the next morning he sees his family and, uh, and his family says, what happened to you? Uh, what happened to you? And he says, I wrestled. I saw God face to face. Uh, he's, hey, hey, my, my life has changed. I'm never going to be the same again. Uh, and in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith chapter, verse 21, has Jacob in this chapter. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, now get it, leaning on the top of his staff. That brokenness, that experience that he had with God, all those years before, was still there. In order for us to be right with God, we need to be humble and broken before Him. Mac Lynch wrote a song entitled, Broken Things. Five broken loaves by Galilee Shore. Broken and scattered for thousands and more. Oh, what compassion! What joy Jesus brings! Watch how He uses broken things. The chorus says, broken things, broken things. Our God still chooses to use broken things. Break thou myself. Oh, make my heart sing. For God can use this broken thing. One broken box all wasted, we thought. Broken and shattered forgiveness she got. One broken form on Calvary's tree. See how He suffered broken for me. Broken things, broken things. Our God still chooses to use broken things. Break thou myself, O oh, make my heart sing, for God can use this broken thing. The question this morning is this, are you broken? Jacob got alone with God. Jacob was hungry for God. Jacob was broken by God. And Jacob got honest with God. And in order for you to have revival, you must be broken. 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Brokenness is the beginning of revival. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.